Hello. Hey. How are you? I'm good. Ready to roll. Yeah, great. I'll uh, share your screen as well. Thank you. That seems to work. Rob, nice having you. And yes, I guess thanks. Have fun, okay, right? Here we go. Hello, folks. It's great to be here, and uh, thanks for watching. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Visual Vestayen and especially Jonas, you just saw, who put this all together. And it's been a great ride. I'm Rob. I'm a front-end designer and developer. And since a few years, I solely, solely use Statomic. And I love it. So what I use is this starter kit called Peak. Uh, it's my own work, and I open sourced it. And I use it basically to build every site that I do in Statomic, whether it's a bespoke design, something simple, something complex. Um, this is my boilerplate, so to say. And it has quite a few tricks up its sleeve. So I would like to start and dive in. Uh, here we go. So when you install Peak via the Statomic CLI, this is what you'll end up with. And you might notice this is a little different from other starter kits because this starter kit is actually pretty ugly by default. And I would definitely not advise you to use to use it like this on production. It's a, it's a boilerplate. So use it to create your own bespoke designs. Um, as you can see, there's a little toolbar bar here you can use. Um, let me say first, the starter kit is very opinionated. It uses Stillwind CSS, Alpine JS, and in this talk, I'm assuming you know a little bit about all of the technolo technology involved. So let's go on. We've got a toolbar here that shows you your current Tailwind breakpoint. You can hide the thing if you want, if it's in the way. This option, this toggle is persistent. Um, we've got a navigation with sub navigation. There's some content, a block here and a block here. And there's some default content just to show people who are just starting uh, what Peak is and what it can do by default. So there's a dynamic contact form implementation, uh, long form content using the BART field set. And we'll dive into all of that a little bit later. Let me get my notes here. OK. So what I want to do is show you the control panel after you uh, installed Peak. And as you can see, we've got a few pages, which we're going to delete in a second. We've got a navigation by default that's tied into the navigation on the front end. We've got globals. So you can configure your browser appearance. You can set settings for this current customer. You can set up redirects, configure uh, search engine optimization, and implement the social media accounts for your client. There's a, a lot of blueprints for all the globals and for the pages involved, and a lot of field set. All those field sets are being used and imported uh, in the page builder that Peak has, in the globals that we use. And all this stuff is reusable. You will see that later on. In the uh, check the file system, uh, for all the views you get by default. So there's a there's a structure I came up with uh, for components. Those are all the, the the views you need to render buttons, to render the icons in the footer, uh, to render all the stuff that you just saw in the in the BART field. Uh, you get your email templates that are automatically used in when you send out a contact form, your error page, the layout and the blocks you build your site with. We'll get into detail with all of those later. So let's actually start uh, by removing the default content that's in Peak. So a little while ago, I started adding just a tiny bit of default content so that new users kind of can see what Peak is and what it does and how you can use it. And well, it might take you a little time to clear this up every time, but I think it's worth it. So let's clear the blocks on our home page. Delete the one asset we just saw. There we go. And right now we should have 
a pretty empty site. If only I would have pressed saved when I cleared out my homepage. Let's go back real quick. There you go, it's still there. I didn't press save. Yes. Okay. So this is our barebone website. We have a header, we have a, an area for our content, and we have our footer. Let's uh, switch branches real quick and discard any changes I just made. There we go. The website should refresh. And the difference here is I've actually started configuring Tailwind to use the, our client's brand. And the way you configure Tailwind, it's basically what you do at the start on any, on any site you make with Peak, is add all the variables like colors, typography. I've actually split, split the Tailwind conf configuration up in four files. We've got our base file that imports all, all of those uh, custom config files and it configures the just-in-time compiler. We've got a config file for Tailwind typography. That's the configuration we use when we render out long-form content in, in the BART field you just saw. We've got a config file for Peak. So the page builder in Peak has all kinds of utilities to evenly lay out the content on your page. And if, should you want to tweak that, you can do that here. It's all documented, so if you're looking for something, make sure to skim it through, read the comments, and I hope it will make sense to you. But the important one is actually the tailwind.config.site.js file. And this is where you configure stuff like typography, uh, the font you use, and the colors for your current brand. So I've gone ahead and set up a few co colors. The neutral color, which is used for text, and some brand colors right here. Now, I work with this default property you can use in Tailwind. And the reason I do that is to make sure you can use either 10 shades in your design or one single color. And in either cases, the classes used in the templates that ship with Peak will work. Um, so that's in there. Now let's configure the browser appearance for this website. To do that, we go to the control panel, go to globals, and then we hit browser appearance. In here, we can set a team color. And the team color, for those who don't know, is the color that is being used in the title bar for browsers like uh, modern Safari, iOS, Safari, or Android. And what I want to do now is set a color that matches the brand of our client for day mode and set a color for night mode. There we go. And if we save this and refresh the front page, we should have a color title bar, yes. Another thing that I usually start out with is at the, the favicons. Uh, it's something I don't like doing, so I automated it. And it's pretty easy now. You want to enable favicons, you have to have Imagic installed. You pick an SVG. You set a color for Safari, because Safari likes to do things a little differently. There we go, I picked the brand color of our client. And if we, when we save this, Imagic will actually use that SVG and render it to various icons. So in assets, we should have a couple of icons now. Let's see. In our Favicon container, yes, there we go. We have an Android icon, an Apple Touch icon, and the original SVG we uploaded. So this is now being used in our layout file. Uh, and we're done with that. Let's see, the last thing in this step I want to do is add some body classes. So let me open up the layout file, take you through there. This is the, the base layout file. We're loading in our style sheets, our JavaScript. I have a, we have a no script partial to enter, show some text for people who don't have JavaScript on. 
We're loading in our search engine snippet, our browser appearance snippet, and then the main content of our entries. So let's change the body layout classes real quick. And then we should get not a white, but a very lightly tinted background. Yes. Okay. After the next step, which are collections. So in case you didn't notice yet, we're building a site for Angeline Travis and she's a, she's a writer and a photographer. So we need a few collections. Let's discard my current changes and whoops, switch to step three. Okay, there we go. When this is done refreshing, we have an actual books page and a news page. Now this step that I just prepared is all native static stuff. So I basically added two collections and let's check them out. We've got a news collection and some entries in there. And the news collection has an image and it's date based. So we get a date and that's about it. Right here, you see the field set that's imported in this blueprint, which is the page builder field set. Uh, you can import that wherever you want on your collection. If you want your uh, client to be able to dynamically build their entries for some collection that might be useful for other, others, maybe not. And this is the search engine optimization field set. So when you've imported that, uh, the rendering of all these fields will basically be automatic. We also have a book blueprint. And that one is a little bit more advanced. It has the page builder again. And we've got a book tab with the release date, a teaser, some cover art, and some information about the book. And some reviews by users. OK. What I want to show you is the index page for news. So this is the index page for news, and it basically fetches the news collection and renders those. How does it work? Index news. Here we go. This is the default stuff that's in your default template, and this is the stuff that's unique for the news collection. So we render in a title here, and we fetch our collection. Now, this is where the stuff that's in Peak really comes in handy, because stuff like pagination, you don't really have to think about. You just use it. Let's set this to two. So pag pagination kicks in, as we only have three entries. And let's refresh the page. And there we go. Since I've included the pagination partial, uh, this is all we have to do. So that's pretty handy. And of course, this partial pagination partial is all antlers. So it's up to you to decide how these buttons look and how the pagination actually works. And for each item, we'll load in a news item component. And that's the stuff you see being rendered here. Next up. Our site still looks a little too peaky, so let's change that a little and add, add a header and a footer. There we go. Our assets are compiling, and it's done compiling. And here we go. We've got an actual header, and we've got an actual footer. So the header and the footer are included in Peak, and it's up to you to decide how it looks. What I wanted to show you real quick was the navigation partial. You see it's responsive and it has some funny animation there. So how does this partial look? Well, like this. This is our desktop navigation. What we do is basically loop through all the items in our navigation and set classes based on if a page is active or not. The mobile navigation uh, is interactive by default. We use Alpine.js for that. And it's up to you how to style it, but basic stuff uh, is, is there. So focus is trapped 
when your navigation is open, the body you you we prevent the body from scrolling uh, when you open the navigation. So all that kind of stuff you really don't have to think about. All you need to do is focus on the design and implement the correct markup. So let's move to the meat of Peak, which is the page builder. What I want to do now is actually build out the home page. There we go. And for that, I'm going to go to the pages collection, go to the home page, and hit live preview. So let's make this a little bit wider. So the page builder has quite a few sets by default. Um, these are not the these are part the default sets and part set I made specific specifically for this design. So let's start with an introduction. Okay, this side is for Angeline Travis. There we go. How does she look? She looks like this. And this is starting to look way better already. Let's add another block. Let's add a call to action. Okay. Scroll down. About Angeline. I'm just fetching a little bit of text here from my second screen. There we go. We've got some text about Angeline. And if people want to know more, they can add a click the button. So the button, as you've seen before, is already also a part of Peak. And you can uh, add a button wherever you want in whatever field set you want. Learn more about Angeline. I want to link to the About page. Let's create that real quick. About. There it is. And you can also link to external URLs, emails, telephone numbers, or assets. So that's the about block. Now let's highlight an actual book she made. So I mentioned before we have a book collection. So we can just link to a book that's in there. And there it is. We've added her latest book. And the last thing I want to add here is the news collection uh, or the news roll. What that does is fetch the latest three news articles and display them on the page. And there we go. This is our home page. Let's publish it and watch it in all its glory. There it is. And now my computer is freezing up. I hope you folks can still hear me. I have doubts you can still hear me because everything here is frozen. What's happening? We can hear you, Rob. I can at least. Yes, I'm back. Okay. Can you? Yay. Okay. I'm not sure what happened there, but at least I'm back. So what we wanted to do was watch this page in all its full glory. And here it is. That's done. Pretty cool. Now, what I want to highlight is this actual partial that renders these news items. So let's dive into that newsroll.antlers.html. So this is the one that renders the actual news items on our page. Uh, since we use Tailwind CSS, and I tend to work uh, utility only, I really want to make everything a component as much as, as possible. So I don't have to search and replace classes all over my templates. But I, I, I want to reuse as much as possible. So here I render in an H2 element. And the content of the H2 element is the title of our current block. This is what the partial looks like. So once you've set this up for all of your typography partials, 
uh, you can continuously reuse them all over your site. And if you change it here, it will, if you change styling here, the styling on your whole site will change. You can also do stuff like this. Say you want the H1 styles, but render them as an H2. There we go, that's done. Here we're actually fetching the news articles and we're calling in the component news item for all of the entries in this collection. So if we open news item, it's this. So this block here is actually our news item. And the thing I want to show you here is the picture partial. Um, and the picture partial is a way of using responsive images on your site without having to think about it all that much. So I'm feeding it our image. I set cover to true to use object size cover. I set lazy to true and I set my sizes attribute. So I'm basically instructing the browser here to uh, render this image on desktop at approximately 30 viewport width units and on mobile at approxim approximately 90 viewport width units. Well, the partial actually looks like this. There we go. It just fetches all the WebP and original presets that were generated when the client uploaded this image. And we see a lazy loaded responsive image. Siri, get out of the way. And we see a lazy loaded responsive image that, that's actually covered. So it, no matter what the aspect ratio, it will fit. So next up, I want to show you how BART works in Peak. So again, discard and switch. Step six, here we go. Let's see if my compiler is still running. Yep, refresh. And there we have our about page. Okay, let's go to the pages collection open up the about page and let's hit live preview. Whoop, there we go. I'm gonna quickly grab some text here. And to this page, we will not add one of the sets we used earlier, but we're adding article. An article is actually the BART with another layer of sets. So let's see. I want to style the introduction a little differently. So I added a lead set. And I want a nice title about Angeline. H1. Right. This is looking good so far. Let's add an image. Figure. Browse. Well, let's use her lovely portrait again. There it is. And sets like this in BART, since this is all laid out in a grid, uh, have sizing utilities. So you can easily make things larger. Can you? You can, you should. Yeah, there you go, or extra large. Now, the, the way you size these utilities is all done in tilwind.config.peak.js. Let's add a caption. This is Angeline. This and let's add a little quote. So this is interesting text. Let's add a pull quote and make it super large. There we go. Who said this? Well, Angeline, of course. Hey, this is how to work with Bart. And of course, you can extend all these sets based on what you need for this current client. What I want to do now is go to the end result and show off a few more features. Row seven. Go to the home page. So this site is uh, about ready now. I added a contact form and the partial that actually renders this form is dynamic. 
So should you want to add fields to this form, it's easy. Just go to your contact form blueprint, which should be somewhere around here, and add a field. Let's add one, text. Something nice. Say, hello. Say something nice, will you? And let's make it required. Finish. OK, let's move it up. Give it a very odd width so we see how this thing works. Save. And when we refresh the page, there it is, our field with our instruction and our odd width. So I try to use static caching as much as possible on production. But as some might know, static caching doesn't play nice with forms by default. So what Peak does is fetch a CSRF token when you click this button. And that way you can use static caching. This only works when you actually visit the site from the correct domain. This is a little security thing. So if we go to the contact form now and try to send it, Rob, Hi, Angeline, love your site. And let's try to send it. This will not validate because we didn't say something nice. And we didn't agree to the gathering of data. Send. And there we go. It's out. We should get a pretty nice email that you really don't have to style. Oh, you can see my previous test here. So this is the email that goes to the owner of the website with all the content. And this is the thank you email that goes to the sender of the form. And it's automatically styled with the logo of your current client. So the last few features I want to show you have got to do with the globals. I want to show you a little bit of the search engine optimization, which is right here. So these are the global options for search engine optimization. You can set the page title, the website title, define which separator you want to use. You can change titles specifically for collections. So let's say we have our book collection. You might want to add the word book to the page title. So you get something like this, book title, book, site title, which is nice for Google uh, and other search engines. I do the same for the news collection here. What you can also do is set fallback meta descriptions. So let's say a client doesn't add a meta description. I kind of assume they never do because they never seem to do. You select the collection you want to change this for. And here I configured it to use the first text that's used in the page builder. So Peak will fetch the page builder, rip out the first text, and use that as a meta description. For news, we do the same. And for our books collection, we use a custom field. Because as you might remember, a book had a teaser field, which, which we could use uh, as a fallback meta description. What you can also do is set a custom text. This is Angeline's site. She's a writer. Learn more about her books here. So that's that. This will be the default meta description when a customer didn't set one themselves. So you can change all the JSON LD data, add breadcrumbs to the head of your page. Uh, you can configure the sitemap like which collections you want to use, and you can configure trackers. Well, I advise all my clients to use something like Fathom, something privacy friendly. But if you don't care about that, you can, of course, use stuff like Google Tag Manager. And let's see what happens then. So we'll fill in our tracking ID. You don't. And we'll enable the cookie banner as I'm in the European Union. And in the cookie banner, I want to link to the privacy statement. So if I save now and double check if our environment is production, 
it's not. If I refresh any page now, let's go to the home page, we should get a cookie banner. There it is. And this cookie banner is styled by default. So this, like all stuff in Peak, falls back to your Tailwind configuration for your current client. So I didn't do any styling here. It just looks like it fits with the current client. When a user consents, this live talks via with a Google API and loads in the, the tags that are necessary. So when a user has accepted uh, the, the cookie nonsense and they choose they don't want that, they can also revoke it. So a user can reset the cookie consent. And at this point, Google will stop uh, putting all the nonsense on your site. That's the cookie banner. For search engine optimization, uh, there's also uh, per entry settings. So let's check the home page. Go to the SEO tab. And this is where the client can change the default page title, add a meta description, or do advanced stuff like no index, setting canonicals. If you're using a multi-site, Peak will automatically get the correct href lengths and put those in, your, in, in the head of your document. You can set open graph stuff and configure the sitemap. Okay, the last thing I would really want to show you, would like to show you is social sharing. Uh, let's see, I think I've uh, turned it on here. Let's go to the SEO globals, go to the social sharing tab. Yes, it's on. Okay, what Peak can do is basically use Puppeteer, a headless Chrome, to take a snapshot of a route somewhere on your site and use that as an actual OG image. So I've turned this on for pages, news, and books now. And let's see how it works. Because this is actually just a route with a no index, social images slash home. Oops. There we go. So this is the template that uh, Puppeteer will visit and take a snapshot of. This is the regular OG image, and this is the Twitter image. It just has a little different size. Now, the content of this is plain, simple antlers. So you can use social image.antlers.html and style this thing for your current client. What it does here is get the logo, get the page title, and get the entry image. And if there isn't an entry image, it falls back to a global image we've configured. And if we go to the, to, the, to the collection overview right now and go to pages, we can run this action, in this case for the home page. So let's do it right now. And this actually takes some time. If you're running Redis, this will automatically be done in the background. It should be done in a few. There it is. I think we picked this one. And this one should have, yes, its own OG image. So that is pretty darn handy. OK, this is uh, how to kickstart a site with Statomic and with Beak. There's a lot of more features in here. I, I can't talk about them all, but when you use static caching, Lighthouse will score pretty high easily. There's dark mode support. Uh, there's a breadcrumb partial. There are search field partials and a lot more. And this is all I have to show. This is all I have to say to you today. So I hope you enjoyed my talk. I hope you will enjoy all of the other ta talks. And um, thanks for the attention. And see you all and talk to you soon. Bye.